It is the most wonderful time of the year. That's right, friends. The holiday season starts now. Welcome to Teacup for One. My name is Matt and I have two degrees. And like I said, everyone, today we are kicking off the holidays here at Teacup for One. What does that mean? It means I'm gonna try to do as much holiday themed content as I possibly can. I'm not gonna commit to any kind of 12 days of Vlogmas anything because last time I did that for Halloween, like in 2020, it literally almost ended me emotionally, physically, all of that. And I don't wanna resent the holidays. I wanna celebrate the holidays. So look forward to some videos. Maybe it'll be a lot, maybe it won't be a lot. Who knows? But come on this journey with me. So today, to kick off the festivities, we are going to do a very special video because a week ago, a week ago and a day from when I'm actually recording this video, I had the pleasure of going to the Shaw Theatre Festival in Niagara-on-the-Lake to see their second preview of one of two holiday productions they've got running this year. They're doing Christmas Carol, which I saw a few years ago, the first year they did it. It was magical. I actually have a Christmas Carol ornament from the festival on the tree somewhere. I'll find it later. Should I do a video where I show you what's on my tree? Is there interest in that? Because I will. But anyway, no. I saw the second preview of their production of White Christmas. And I didn't just get to see the production, I got to explore the beautiful little town of Niagara-on-the-Lake. I mean, Niagara-on-the-Lake's like, I think, a giant city, but like, I got to go to the picturesque part where the festival actually happens. It is like walking through a Christmas movie, like a Hallmark Christmas movie, or a Netflix Christmas movie. A Christmas movie, like any, basically any good Christmas movie that's not funded by Candace Cameron Bure. Bure? Burr. I'm just gonna call her Candace Cameron Burr because she's an ice queen. Also, look at this. Look what I found under my tree. Oh, it's the Stage Light Flickers by Emerson Arts. Oh. We'll talk about this in a little bit. But first, enjoy some footage of me exploring Niagara on the lake and going to see White Christmas at the Shaw Festival. Then we're gonna come back here. I'm gonna give you my review of White Christmas. All right. We have arrived in the picturesque town of Niagara on the lake. And evidently I dreamt too hard of a white Christmas because today ended up being the first major snowstorm of the year. And it's only November 19th. And I mean, I know those of you in America watching probably think, oh, it's Canada. It's always snowing. No, no, no. Like Southern Ontario, this, this, this doesn't typically happen until like late December. So... I don't know, global warming's real. So knowing that the weather was not going to be ideal and knowing that driving would not be fun, um, I ended up getting here early, like almost four hours early, which leaves plenty of time to explore Niagara on the lake and all the fun Christmassy things that it has to offer. Let's go explore. We are outside of the historic Prince of Wales Hotel. And this corner, this specific corner in Niagara on the lake has a lot of history for me personally because the first time I was ever here seeing something at the Shaw Festival, I was in high school. It was a school field trip to see their production of Gypsy. And this is the kind of small picturesque town where during the summer, like you can get a horse and carriage ride. I mean, the morals of that, questionable. But as a teenager, me and my friends were like, yeah, let's ride in the horse carriage. So we asked them how much for a ride from here to the theater. They said like $5 each. Okay. And then climbing into the carriage, my backpack fell into a puddle under the horse. No, it was not water. So I checked my backpack at the coat check at the theater. And then when the show was over, the ushers who were looking after the coat check said, Matthew, we need to talk. And basically, my bag had been quarantined because of the terrible stench of horse excrement that I had brought into the festival theater. And thus began my non-relationship with the Shaw Festival. Okay, let's keep exploring. Our next stop, Balzac's Coffee. Oh, it smells so good. Okay, let's go in. I've found salvage in the warmth of the Balzac's coffee seating area, and I'm now going to try my Balzac's coffee hot chocolate. I didn't get coffee. Here we go. Oh. Mm. 
that is, that is good. That like, if you like hot, and if you like chocolate, and if you like balls, and if you like Zach, you will like this. Like, just look at that. It's frothy. It's hot and it's frothy. So good. So good. Hot chocolate has been consumed. I've warmed up ever so slightly, so now the snow just feels mildly uncomfortable instead of like excruciating. And we are gonna go to the Niagara on the Lake Christmas store. This is a year round Christmas store, and I usually go during the summer, and it's like this is weird because it's hot outside and I'm in a Christmas store. But now we're going during the time of year when this store was intended to be enjoyed. Let's go. It's Mariah Carey as a reindeer. The really fun thing about this Christmas store is that there's like an ornament section for absolutely every taste, every niche. Like you have your traditional Christmas ornaments, but then you have like stuff that's a little bit non-traditional. Barnyard animals, cow and sweater, horse with gifts, flying pig, no prob llama. That llama looks like he has a lot of problems that he's just not willing to face head on. Occupations, teacher, 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 Nursing, nursing. I just can't find the ornament for up and coming YouTuber. Now, which Santa do we think is the creepiest? Okay, I think I just found the cutest thing in the store. It's an entire collection of s'mores ornaments, but they are s'mores that are making little snowmen people of all different varieties. Lumberjack some more. Netflix and chill some more. It's a garden gnome some more. The really cool thing about this is the base is a graham cracker, then there's a piece of chocolate, and then the some more characters sitting on top. We have now reached the rustic Canadian room. So you're gonna notice over on this side, we have fluffy Canadian style animals. Fluffy raccoon, fluffy moose, fluffy owl, fluffy I don't know what this is. And because we're in Canada, there's an entire section dedicated to Christmas cannabis. Every year when I come to the Christmas store, I always want to get the Diet Coke ornament. It's only $11. What? It's only $11. I know. I should get it. Okay, so I'm doing it. This is coming home with me. I am now the proud owner of a Diet Coke Christmas ornament. After almost 10 years of going to that store and thinking, I want it, it's now mine. And now, we have about two hours before the show starts, time for dinner. Dinner has just been consumed. It was phenomenal. Highly recommend the Angel Inn. But now we have just under an hour to get to the theater and look at this beautiful snowfall. It's so Christmassy. And in a little while when I have to drive, it's gonna be terrifying. Great. This is like the kind of magical snowfall that Disney pays thousands of dollars to fake every night. Okay, this is the point in the night where I actually stopped recording because I was in a theater and you can't really record when you're in a theater. But I found some production stills from the Shaw production of White Christmas. I'm going to give you a quick rundown of what it's like to watch White Christmas. Here we go. Act 1. 
1944. We're at war, but we can still have some Christmas spirit. <laughs> it's the 1950s, and now we're famous because of our Christmas spirit. Sisters, sisters, there were never such devoted sisters. Snow, blue skies shining at me. Nothing but blue skies do I see. I love a piano. I love a piano. Tappa, tappa, tappa. Let's put on a show in the barn. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Okay, that's it. Back to the studio. And we are back. I cannot state enough, friends. This trip was the best way to kick off the holiday season for me. You know, like I said in my Cursed Child video, as well as in my uh, Stratford video, it just means so much to me as a theater person, as somebody who has worked in theater for pretty much all of my professional life, as somebody who loves theater, to be able to go back to theater this year in 2022, it's a whole other kind of magic. But you combine that with Christmas magic, mind blown. Especially for me, not being able to go to a theater for pretty much two and a half, almost three years because of all the 2020 pandemonium related shutdowns. And on that note, I actually want to come back to this wonderful Christmas gift that I found magically under my tree. This is a book called The Stage Light Flickers. This book was actually compiled and written in part by my friend Mason through his theater company, Emerson Arts. So The Stage Light Flickers, it's kind of comparable to, like, do you remember those books, Chicken Soup for the Fill-in-the-Blank Soul? This is kind of like Chicken Soup for the Theater Creator's Soul who went through massive periods of uncertainty, not knowing if our industry was ever going to survive or recover. Uh, let me read you the back of the book. Here we go. Before you now are 32 individual experiences from performers of all types that have stripped down their personal stories to provide insights into our world during, you know. So there are 32 different con contributions, essentially, and they're all different types of material. There are streams of consciousness, there are like short stories, there are scripts, there are cocktail recipes. The cocktail recipe segment is my personal favorite. And they're all theater-based artists that have different disciplines and different areas of expertise. In fact, some of the artists who contributed to this book are actually alumni and current performers at the Shaw Theater Festival. But the reason that I think that this book is so apropos, did I use that word right? I don't know, I don't care. But the reason I think that this book is so apropos for a discussion about White Christmas is because in some ways, they're exploring similar themes, similar ideas. And this is actually why I think White Christmas was such a brilliant choice for the Shaw Festival to program as part of their first full season back post-2020 pandemonium. Because White Christmas is a musical about compassion through theater in the years following World War II. Now, in no way am I saying that what we lived through the past few years was comparable to living through a world war. But I do think it's fascinating watching White Christmas now, just with this perspective of having this shared, like this globally shared experience of having the world shut down and then figuring out what to do with yourself, especially as artists, once it starts to reopen. So with that said, Let's start to talk about White Christmas, the production at Shaw. Kind of. I don't want to go too much into an official review because this is the thing. Remember, I saw their second preview performance. And I know that I'm like not really a real theater reviewer, but it is kind of theater etiquette that you don't officially review a show until it's officially open. Like that's the point of previews. They iron out some kinks, they do the show, they have some test audiences, and I was lucky enough to be one of those test audiences. Test audience is probably the wrong word. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Moving on. A week and a bit ago, I had no idea what White Christmas was. I had never seen the movie. And so, like the good teacup that I am, I did my homework. I watched the movie from the 50s with Bing Crosby, with Danny Kaye, with Vera Ellen, with Rosemary Clooney, and then I had some perspective and some context for going in to watch the musical adaptation. So first, I just want to talk a little bit about the movie White Christmas as someone who has just seen it for the first time. It was so much fun. It was like take singing in the rain and make it Christmas. I think without a doubt the highlight for me were those incredible 1950 style movie musical giant production numbers, you know? No decade or no era knew how to do a mega movie musical production number like the 50s. And just adding on the Christmas aesthetic with all the dancers and everything, oh, 
absolute Christmas magic. And the cast is iconic in every sense of the word. I mean, it's Bing Crosby. He was like the king of Christmas before Mariah Carey usurped the throne. It's my turn now. Get out. And I have to say, there was this absolutely beautiful sequence in White Christmas that I was not prepared for right at the beginning when Bing is singing White Christmas. It's a song that I have heard so many times throughout my life and just seeing it in the context that is presented in the film, namely Bing's character singing it to his fellow troops during the war, that context just completely changed my reading of the song and like I got emotional and it wasn't even 10 minutes into the movie. It was such a powerful moment and it was so simple and so good and just all the elements came together to create this truly magical piece of Christmas movie cinema. I adored it. Now that's not to say that the movie was perfect. There were a few issues that I had with it. Like I think some plot points were more convoluted and complicated than they needed to be. There were two that really stood out for me. One was that weird will they won't they relationship between Phil and Judy. I was like, you two are clearly into each other. Stop pretending that you're in a fake relationship for the benefit of your brother slash sister. Like, just kiss already. And then the other issue that I had was that the whole misunderstanding that eventually leads to the big conflict between Betty and um, whatever Bing's character's name is, I could look it up, I'm not going to. Whatever that big misunderstanding is when the lady's listening on the phone and she thinks that they're out to humiliate the general, like that was, that was more complicated than it needed to be. And it made me think harder than I wanted to think for a Christmas movie. So those are just some of my opening thoughts, having seen the film for the first time. But now let's talk about the stage adaptation. And not necessarily Shaw's production specifically, but just how the movie has been adapted to the stage. I find adaptations particularly fascinating, especially in a case like this. A case where you have a musical that was written specifically to be a film, and then once that film like gets massive popularity, people decide, okay, let's put it on stage. Like. I feel like that's not as smooth a transition as when you have a successful stage musical and you adapt it into a movie. Because when you're creating a musical for the silver screen, you're doing it with the knowledge that you can do things that you can't do on stage. So I think that's the reason that some of my favorite songs and numbers from the movie didn't actually make it into the stage production. I mean, I was admittedly a little disappointed that we didn't get Mandy or we didn't get that wonderful dance sequence from the movie where Danny Kaye is like, the theater, the theater, what happened to the theater? Specifically when it comes to dance or, you know, something like that. But what they did instead of that was they replaced those songs with other songs from the Bing Crosby jazz Christmas canon. I really should have done more research to tell you where those songs came from and I didn't. Maybe they were in Holiday Inn. Who knows? But they added songs that weren't in the film, which I think was a brilliant choice because it still allowed the structure of having these characters who were creating a wonderful Christmas spectacular show in the barn of the inn. They were just changing what the songs were. They were allowing the productions the opportunity to create their own memorable production numbers with songs like Blue Skies and I Love a Piano, incidentally. Those were my two favorite production numbers in the shop production. I know I'm not supposed to give an official review because it was a preview, but like the dancing in those songs was incredible. And that just, I think, proves my point. It's such a smart move, whoever adapted the movie to the stage, to plant in those songs to just give like a blank canvas to the theater creators, to the director, to the choreographer, to create their own unique production numbers. So. That was cool. I think the other smart thing that this adaptation did was they remedied those two big issues I had with the movie. They simplified Phil and Betty? Judy. Judy. Yeah. They simplified Phil and Judy's relationship so that they were just into each other and they went with it. They were like, let's just be in a relationship. They didn't have that whole manipulative thing that was like, let's have a fake engagement. No, they got rid of that. And the other thing that they did, which I, I was so thankful for this, they simplified and adjusted the big misunderstanding that causes that rift between Bob and Betty. In the movie, it's this complicated thing where Martha, the lady who works at the inn, thinks, oh no, these guys are looking to humiliate the general. And that was, I don't know, it was, confusing and didn't make a ton of sense to my feeble brain. But in the musical, straightforward to the point, Martha thinks they are trying to buy the barn 
and go behind the back of the general, thus leaving him, like, bankrupt, humiliated, and without a barn or an inn or whatever. Like, I understand that. That's easy. And it allows the plot to unfold in the exact same way, but it doesn't leave me thinking, wait, what's going on? And while we're on this topic, I know I said that I technically saw a preview and I'm not really in a position to fairly give a full review of the production, but, 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 there was one performer that I need to acknowledge because he just, he put in a performance that ultimately made the show for me. And that was David Allen Anderson as General Waverly. Now, General Waverly is kind of the heart of White Christmas in some ways because the entire plot is about Bob and Phil wanting to band together to do something special for their general. And for that story to really work, I think as an audience member, I need to care about the general. When I was watching the movie, like I didn't not care about the general, but like he he didn't he didn't have my heart. David Allen Anderson had my heart. From the very first scene when they're still at war and he addresses the audience like I was just in a place of I would go to war for you man and yes I know that's like literally the point and I guess my point is that David Allen Anderson pulled it off and I didn't realize that that is truly the key to White Christmas it's easy to care about Bob and Phil and Betty and Judy but if you don't care about the general that they're doing all of this wonderful stuff for, then you kind of miss the heart of White Christmas. And David Allen Anderson's portrayal of Waverly, it just had this wonderful air of respectability coupled with vulnerability and empathy. And like when he, there's this moment, which does happen in the movie as well, but there's this moment when he gets a letter that's ultimately telling him that he's not able to go back into service. And when it happened in the movie, I just thought, like, blip on the radar, meh, whatever. David Allen Anderson in that scene, I just felt like the heartbreak, really, of somebody who was trying to go back to the thing that defined him, and all of a sudden it was gone. And it had such a stronger payoff at the end when he ultimately decided, yes, I'm going to keep the inn and do wonderful things with it. Like, I am going to move on from this thing that at one point was my everything. I'm going to embrace a new everything. And again, to take it back to why I think White Christmas is such a perfect musical for right now, this place in time, like, that's it. And again, to bring it back to the stage light flickers, that ties into one of my personal favorite entries in the book, which was from a theater artist named Matt Lacus. I mean, I'm kind of biased because I got to support another Matt who works in theater. But he had this wonderful entry about how once theater shut down, he was trying to figure out what other skills he had, what other passions and interests he had. And then that eventually evolved into him creating something new called Isolation Cocktails, which is this wonderful online, and maybe they're in person now? I need to do the research. This wonderful cocktail class. And he actually, part of his entry is including cocktail recipes. And I think there's something really special about that, about assessing the things that are important to you, figuring out what your passions are, and then coming up with ways to feed them. You know, that's what we saw from the general in White Christmas. That's what many of the artists are talking about in this book. And if I'm being completely transparent, that is how I ended up starting this channel. It was figuring out a way to feed my passions when all the things were gone. And ultimately, here we are, years later, things are open again, theater is back, the industry is starting to start up again, but I love this. And it wouldn't be possible without the support of a community, which in this case is you, the person watching this. So thank you. And bringing it back to White Christmas, that is the heart and soul of White Christmas. It's just this beautiful story about people being compassionate and using their art to reach out to somebody just to show them that they are there and that they support them to help them make the decisions to move forward. I guess what I'm saying is that I thoroughly enjoyed White Christmas, both seeing the movie and seeing the stage production. 
and I think it's a fantastic piece just to revisit, well, any holiday season, but especially this one for all the reasons ultimately that I've already discussed. And with that, friends, this concludes our first 2022 holiday edition of Teacup 41. Now, once again, I want to extend a big thank you to Mason as well as the folks at Emerson Arts for sending me my own copy of the Stage Light Flickers. If you'd like to pick up a copy for yourself, highly recommend it. I'll leave details for you in the video description down below as to where you can find your own copy of the Stage Light Flickers. Now, also let me know in the comments section down below have you ever seen White Christmas and what do you think of it? And have you ever seen the musical? What do you think of the adaptation? And if you want to be the first to know when I release more holiday videos this wonderful holiday season, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed already. If you haven't subscribed already, it's so easy. All you have to do is click on my face. Thanks for joining me today, everyone. My name is Matt and I have two degrees and this has been the Holiday Tea Cup for One. I love piano, I love piano, I love...